everybody. Um, I'm Jean-Claude, chef at Pincho. <laughs> but you're obviously not here to see me. So we're here to, uh, this is a pretty landmark Authors at Google. We're here to uh, welcome Chef Thomas Keller, which I'm sure I don't need to go too far into detail about who he is. Um, he's one of three chefs that has received two Michelin or three Michelin stars in two different restaurants at the same time. James Beard Awards everywhere. Um, <laughs> pretty much a, a destination restaurant wherever you go that he has one. Um, I grew up I grew up cooking in the Napa Valley, and uh, the day he opened up the Bouchon Bakery ended up being my uh, lunch spot every single day before before work. I'd get a little baguette with ham and Swiss and an orangina, like a good little French boy. <laughs> so I thank you for that, Chef. So he'll be speaking to us today, uh, hopefully about his culinary philosophies, his new book, lecture about sous vide, which some of you have seen us do at the Basic Deli and Five and now at Pincho. So without further ado, I'm going to keep it short and sweet, Chef Thomas Keller. Thank you, Chef. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm really uh, overwhelmed that so many of you are interested in food, but <laughs> after touring the, um, the campus today, um, it's everywhere. Uh, and, and what they say about there's no free food certainly doesn't exist here at Google. Um, I was a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, it must be very difficult to be in, in a community like this where there's such a, a, choice, a choice overload. I don't, know how, I don't know how you do it. You stand in that line and there's just there's just so many different things going on. I, I, it would drive me crazy. But um, it's, it's a real tribute to, um, to the vision of, of Google and, and what they stand for. And you know, I'm very proud to be here today, to, to, to have been um, invited down here to speak to you uh, about, about cooking, about philosophy, about books, uh, about you know, a few things that are, that are important to me. And it's interesting, um, as, a, as, a young, as a young cook, even as a young child, um, you never really know what lies ahead and, and, and the path that you take and, and the changes that are made in your life are, are, are many times defined by other people. And I am very, very grateful to have known some really wonderful people in my life who have given me direction, uh, who have mentored me, um, who have beat me up on, on, on some occasions to get me where I am today. Some people say, you know, what would you change? in your life had you the choice to change. And you know, I, I, th I thought about that the first time for a few moments. And of course, I don't have to think about it anymore because there's nothing I would change. Because I wouldn't be the person I am today without the successes and failures that I experienced throughout my life and throughout my career. Uh, it's interesting, though, career paths. Um, it, it's odd for me. I've been cooking now for over 32 years. I know I don't look that old, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and when I started cooking, there was no such thing as really a celebrity chef. It was kind of an, uh, an odd thing. And as it developed, and to, to, to be considered a celebrity chef is, is even more odd to me than some of my younger colleagues who may or may not have thought about becoming a celebrity chef early on in their careers. And certainly today, as that, as that uh, manifests itself in some of our culinary schools, certainly in some of our restaurants, um, the idea of becoming a celebrity chef is certainly on a lot of people's mind, and how, how will they become the next Tom, uh, Thomas Keller or the next Daniel Balud, or um, even some of our TV personalities, Bobby Flay, Emeril Lagasse, and, 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 and chefs like that. Uh, as a young man, I didn't really find um, that interesting because it didn't exist. What, what really resonated with me, or what really was I was in search for, was, was actually some fun. Um, as, a young, as a young cook, that's what it was all about, having, having fun. And I found that in the kitchen. Uh, and more, more important for me, it was, about, it was about that team, being part of a team. And certainly in a the kitchen, there, there's a real team atmosphere, a real team attitude. Uh, and that is something bigger than anything that I had going individually as an individual. So the team, the team really resonated with me. A couple of other things that were 
were very important at a young age that I learned, and, and certainly something that was um, beneficial to me becoming uh, a chef and becoming a really good chef was rituals and repetition. You think about that, rituals and repetition, because that's what a kitchen is all about. It's about doing specific things at the same time every day to prepare yourself for service that night and repeating it over and over and over and over and over again until you really become good at it. I don't know if any of you have read the recent book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers. Does anybody read that book? That was an interesting book for me because I realized, and, and according to his philosophy, it takes 10,000 hours to become really good at something. Well, if there's anybody who exemplifies that, it was, it was myself, uh, spending hours and hours and hours chopping, dicing, cutting, whatever, whatever the, the task was. I enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed, I found comfort, not only in the kitchen and the team, but I found comfort in those rituals and repetition. Uh, I, I remember back when I first started to become part of a kitchen, my mother uh, ran restaurants when I was a young child, and I was the youngest of five boys. I would go into the kitchen after, after school, and she'd put me on a milk crate in front of a dishwasher. And it was at that moment in my life that I really started to understand rituals, or not understand rituals and repetition, but, but gravitate towards that, the, 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 the process of washing dishes, the organization, the efficiency that you had to have, the becoming part of the team. That was something that in my, in my later years would really resonate to me. So rituals and repetition was something that was very important in becoming a good cook. Uh, another thing that was very important to me, and someone told me this a long, long time ago, treat it like it's yours and one day it will be. Treat it like it's yours and one day it will be. And so every restaurant that I worked in, whether I was a dishwasher, whether I was a young commis, whether I was a chef de partie, whether I was a sous chef or a chef, I treated that restaurant as if it was my own. Cleaning it, organizing it, that was my, that was my space. If that was my station, if I was on the fish station, that was my station. <laughs> No one could come into that station. I would organize it. It was, I owned it. Uh, and I really believed in that. And of course, I mean, today I have nine restaurants, so it was a really, a really good advice coming that way. Treat it like a Georgia one day it will be. Another thing that really resonated with me was uh, uh, another friend of mine said, luck comes to those who work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> now, I think a lot of you could probably relate to that. Um, and, and certainly he wasn't saying that literally, but, but being a, aware, being, being able to cast that net as far as you can, being able to come in contact with as many people as you can was very important. Working 24 hours a day, seven days a week is, is actually, I took that literally um, and, and, and worked as much as I could. I would do not only work in my, my day job or my paying job, but then I would end up going to other restaurants and learning what was going on, doing stages, doing observations, if you will, in other restaurants. I spent a year and a half in France in the early 80s doing exactly that, doing stages in, in restaurants, in eight different restaurants. Really gave me a great exposure. And my time in France wasn't learning about cooking. I had been cooking at that point for almost eight years. I had a, a really good foundation in classic cooking, and classic French cooking. And I was fortunate to go after eight years, even though I tried to go earlier. And I was fortunate because I wasn't focused on learning how to cook. I was focused on what makes the French so great at what they do. And what that was was their attention to detail and their consistency. And that was something that I brought back from France and has been part of my philosophy ever since. It's not, not, not being able to cook the greatest food, being able to put great food consistently. Certainly, ultimately, I learned the real reason that I cook, uh, and that's nurturing, nurturing people. Because we know we try, we, try to, we try to do the best that we can. We try to cook at a very, very high level for a lot of different reasons. But at the end of the day, it's nurturing people in many different ways, not just physically, but emotionally as well. And then I realized it wasn't just about nurturing our guests. They were almost a byproduct of what we do. Because once the plate leaves the kitchen, who knows what happens to it? It's about nurturing ourselves and that experience in the kitchen. See, it's not, not, not about food at all, but it's about the experience that we share with one another that compels us to continue to do what we do every day. And it's not a job, believe me, it's a lifestyle. Whoever thought that cooking was a job is wrong. It has to be a lifestyle. You have to commit to it 100%. Of course, there are many challenges and setbacks throughout my career.
I had several restaurants that failed. I was fired from a couple for odd different reasons, or I thought they were odd different reasons. I had to learn many new skills as, as a young cook because a cook's responsibility was evolving, a chef's responsibility was evolving. The time in America was becoming more and more evident that chef, that cooking, that food was once again important. And I say once again because at some time in our history, food was important to us. I started to formulate the idea of a modern chef, a generation of young American chefs who were going to set examples for the generations to follow. There were three keys to success for me, I believe. Persistence. As I mentioned, I had failed in restaurants. I had been fired from restaurants. The French Laundry was my last hope, my last opportunity, I felt. If I didn't make it there, I didn't know what I was going to do. Possibly move to Tahiti and live on the beach fish. <laughs> I lost my restaurant in New York City in 1980, uh, sorry, 1990. Um, I could have stayed there. My partner wanted to reformat the restaurant to a casual restaurant. There was times like we live in today where the economy was struggling. Um, comfort food became something that was a buzzword. It wasn't really about comfort food as much as it was about price points. And the restaurant I had in New York City called Raquel was fine dining. I could have made the choice of staying at Raquel, which was, again, my first real restaurant, something that I had poured all my emotion into, all my money into. But it wasn't what I wanted to do. I had to stay true to my goals, and that was fine dining. My unwillingness to compromise the quality of the work that I had set out to do. It led me to California, to Southern California, to Los Angeles. It's the black days of my career. I remember after 18 months there, out of work, standing at the end of aisles in grocery stores, trying to sell a small olive oil that I started to produce to blue-haired ladies who didn't understand why olive oil was $12 a bottle. <laughs> but I persevered. I found the French Laundry in 1992 and thought, this is it. This is where I should be. It was destiny, fate, whatever you want to call it. I felt that this was my calling. I set out to try to organize myself and purchase the restaurant. It was a very difficult time, 18 months of doing something I had no idea about what I was doing. I was able to fund the restaurant three different ways, through a commercial bank loan, through a small business administration loan, which at the time, if you think about it, a white middle class educated male getting a small business administration loan was unheard of. Again, at the time we were coming out of a recession, President Clinton said to the SBA, here's a, here's a pile of money, go out there and give it away. I just happened to be there at the right time in the right place with the right idea. And then of course, through funding through private investors, 43 of them in total. I don't know if any of you have gotten up, on, up in the morning and started to make cold calls to people you didn't know and explain to them that you were out of work chef with an idea to open a restaurant 600 miles to the north in Napa Valley, and would you please give me some money? <laughs> Every day for over a year, I did that. It made me stronger. It made me have more resolve for the project. And in the end, I was successful at purchasing the French Laundry. And looking back on those days, I realized one of the keys to my success was my ignorance. Had I known what it was going to take 18 months before I started that project, I would have said, you know what? I can never do this. I would never be able to get a commercial bank loan, never be able to get an SBA loan, and certainly not have the opportunity to convince 43 people after calling over 500 to give me money. It was my ignorance that led me through. It was those little successes every day. It's making a little bit of an inroad every day that kept me going forward. And then, of course, one of my last reasons for success, I believe, is my continually challenging myself to do a better job. 
Continuous improvement is also a double-edged sword. I tend not to be satisfied with what I've done. I have to stand back sometimes and just look at a big picture and say, look at all the things I've accomplished. That, that double-edged sword can cut very deep. The gratification and satisfaction that I have to have, that I have to display, not only, not only to feel good about what I've done myself and be satisfied, but also displayed to over 650 employees is very, very important. I have to say, you know what? We've done a tremendous job. Yes, we can do a better job. Yes, we can continue to challenge ourselves. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You've accomplished great things. So I talked about a modern chef. What is a modern chef? To understand what a modern chef is, we have to remember what a chef was before. What a chef was in the last generation was a person who ran a kitchen. One kitchen in one restaurant with one menu. Think about that. There was no changing menus. The menu stayed, stayed stagnant. One of my true mentors, even though he passed away uh, before I was born, is a man named Ferdinand Point. He worked his whole career on developing recipes and evolving those recipes to a point of where he thought they were per perfect. And of course, once you reach perfection, you realize that there's no such thing as perfection. You continue to, to, to persevere and try to do it better. His marjolaine was just such a recipe where he continued to work on developing that recipe over and over again, never being satisfied with it. One restaurant, one kitchen, one menu. Today, that doesn't exist. Today, chefs own multiple restaurants. Uh, we have numerous employees. As I mentioned, I have over 650 employees. We're involved in many different areas of our industry. We have, we're, we're setting examples for, for the next generation of chefs. We have opportunities that other chefs of the past generation didn't have. It's amazing some of the projects that we can be involved in. I have to step outside of the kitchen these days. I'm standing before you. I mean, you think the last generation of chefs would be standing in front of a group of people other than industry, other than his own industry, if that happened at all, and speaking about what his philosophy is, what his culture is like, about his books, that would never happen. I have no, no formal training in culinary arts. I have no formal training in public speaking. I have no formal training in finance. I have no formal training in design. I have no formal training in in anything, really, <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> but that doesn't stop me. I've designed for Christoffel, a very well-known uh, French silver company, original designs for them. I've designed for a French porcelain company, Reno, and not just design, but form and shape. Of, of porcelain, of China. It's never been done before by anybody outside of a porcelain company, let alone an American chef designing for a French firm. You know how arrogant they can be and no. <laughs> All due respect, chef. But you're an American now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've written three cookbooks, actually four. The fourth one will be out in November. I've uh, consulted uh, in Hollywood on, 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 a, on a movie, consulted here in the, uh, in the East Bay with Pixar on, on another movie. Um, I, I've done en endorsements, uh, food-related products. Think of the things now that a modern chef does and the impact that he has on our, on, on our culinary landscape. Those are, those are certainly important things, but not something that I've done ever for the for the rewards, for the monetary rewards. They've always been something that have been connected to the restaurant, to promote our restaurant, to promote our philosophy, to promote our culture. To be able to design your own China that you have a vision for as it relates to plating food is something that can be very, very impactful. And now you see today, other chefs now are designing their own China, designing their own silverware. The examples that we set today will evolve for the next generation of chefs. And they'll reach even higher plateaus, which is, for me, one of the true meanings of success, is to have an impact, to have a legacy in our industry. All these things, of course, wouldn't have happened 
without one element that I, is one of my core values, and that is collaboration. True collaboration happens every day in our restaurants, whether it's in the dining room or in the kitchen. Anybody can have an impact. Anybody can have a voice. A young woman eight years ago named Erin Tishy, who was a coffee server at the restaurant, the French Ronnie at the time, walked by me one day and said, Chef, why don't you make a granite out of sake? A granite is like a frozen, typically a frozen sweet dessert. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I've got this young coffee server walking by me, giving me an idea about making a granite out of sake. We worked on the recipe for a couple of weeks. It's something that now is in our repertoire. She had the confidence, the courage, the comfort to say to Thomas Keller, listen, chef, why don't you do this? It's an amazing thing what collaboration can do. We sit around every night at the restaurant for the past 15 years at the end of service and decide what the menu is going to be for the next day. The menu changes every day at the French Laundry and at Per Se in two different locations. Now, it's very difficult for one person to drive all those ideas. I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way. It's that effort of collaboration that results in something more profound than any one individual could have an impact on. Collaboration is apparent in everything that I've done, from our menus to the design work to our books. It's in everything that we do. It's something that I'm very proud of is to be part of a team that has that spirit of collaboration. What is technology? Uh, let's talk, I mean, what is technology today? And, and, and something that all of you are certainly on the cutting edge of and deal with every day. I, I see, I've never seen a group of people that have so many laptops. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's like, it's like your, 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 it's an extension on your arm. Every, <laughs> Everybody walks around with a laptop. And, I, and, I, and I've heard that some of you have more than one. Um, you, know, you know, technology is interesting in our kitchens. Um, and it's interesting how, how, how we embrace technology or we don't embrace technology. Um, you think back on, on technology in kitchens, and you must wonder what it was like to cook with coal before there was gas-fired ranges. What it was like not to have refrigeration. Even, even more current, what it was like not to have a food processor. When I started cooking, the food processor did not exist. We didn't have Cuisinart's. We didn't have RoboCoops. We didn't have any of those things. When we made a puree, we had to put it in a blender, which was the little Hamilton Beach, or chop it, and chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it, and then pass it through sieves to, to make a puree. That's how we did it back then. So technology has certainly had an impact in our industry and cooking. Today, we're, we're faced with a new technology, or maybe not so new depending on how, how you look at it. We have a selective memory, of course, as, as a community. And sometimes we think that nothing has happened before, or it, it's, certainly not, it's certainly not new. We think about technology today as sous vide cooking. And how many of you know about sous vide cooking? OK. Um, sous vide cooking, I think you all know about. Um, or certainly you know about sous vide, because you buy products every day in sous vide. I was just out here in the little marketplace, and there's three things in the, in the refrigerator that I just saw that are sous vide packaged. There's little cheese sticks in there. There's some crackers in, with cheese in there as well. And I, and I think there's, there was some, was there some lunch meat or something like that out there that's, that's all packaged in sous vide. Sous vide means removal of air, of oxygen. Oxygen, of course, is something that deteriorates the quality of, of food, or you know, as well as us. I mean, that's why we all take antioxidants, right? To get rid of those free <laughs> Well, that's what we want to do with our food, is remove the oxygen so that it doesn't deteriorate, it doesn't spoil. So that is exactly what sous vide is. Sous vide was um, developed in the 30s by a company here in Northern California called Hills Brothers. And they, of course, vacuum packed their coffee to keep it fresher. Uh, it was something that became popular in the 1950s by a company named Cryovac. You've all heard that word before, Cryovac. Uh, when they started cryovacing turkeys. Before that, turkeys weren't available except at Thanksgiving. Now you can go into a stores, and uh, since then you can go into stores and buy turkeys frozen in cryovac. Of 
course, in the 70s, two Frenchmen, a gentleman named Michel Paulus and another gentleman named Bruno Gosseau, started working with chefs to develop this type of cooking for restaurants. Uh, in particular, Michel Paulus was working with a, a gentleman named, um, uh, well, actually two brothers, the Trois Gros brothers, in Rouen, France, to cook foie gras. Traditionally, when you cook foie gras, there's a lot of waste uh, because the heat and, of course, the, uh, it melts the, the liver and the fat comes out. He wanted to figure out a way to cook it slowly so that he wasn't losing um, the product. So Michel started wrapping it in plastic wrap, cooking it at very low temperatures, which resulted in a better yield. Bruno Gosseau started working with a gentleman named Joel Robichon to develop a menu that was going to be served on SNCF trains, the French railroad trains on long haul trains from Paris to Strasbourg, for example, serving three star food. This is how sous vide started to make its way into restaurant cooking. We started using sous vide cooking when I was at Raquel, or not sous vide cooking, but sous vide uh, technology to, uh, to prolong the shelf life of foie gras. Foie gras oxidizes very quickly, very fast. We would sous vide it under pressure, remove the oxygen, therefore extending the shelf life. We started learning how to cook sous vide in, 19, uh, I'm sorry, in two, 1999 when Bruno Gosseau came to our restaurant and started teaching us how to do it. It's been a big part of our restaurant since. Uh, but it, I have to say that technology cannot replace the craft of cooking. It's something that is very important to me and something that we always maintain is that we need to be cooks. You can actually take a bag and sous vide cooking is boil in a bag. You've all seen that, right? You can go in the grocery store today and buy several items that are boiling in a bag. We can do that. Cooking is about precision. Every cookbook that you own tells you at what temperature to cook something and for how long to cook something. Sous vide cooking allows us to be more precise. It allows us through two pieces of equipment, the vacuum packing machine and the immersion circulator. The immersion circulator is nothing more than a um, a heating coil with a, th with a thermostat and a um, pump that pumps water. So we can keep it at precise temperatures for specific amounts of time. We know that lamb or any piece of red meat cooked medium rare is 59.8 degrees Celsius. We know that. So we can put a piece of lamb in water that's 59.8 degrees Celsius for specific amounts of time and have it come out medium rare perfectly every time. But the threat is we lose the knowledge of how to cook a piece of lamb medium rare. So we don't want to replace our cooking techniques with sous vide. We want to augment it with sous vide technology so that we are still using new technology to produce food that is better than we could do before without losing some of the craft of cooking. So what is the future? What do we look at here in the future? What are we, what are we faced with? For us in our industry, as with any industry, it's about mentorship, mentoring the next generation, mentoring the next generation to take our place. The importance of passing on accumulated knowledge. That is something that we work on every day in our restaurants. How do we open a new restaurant if we don't, if we don't have the staff, if we don't have the personnel to do that? We are identifying the next generation as far back as fourth generation. So when a young cook comes to us that shows some kind of promise, we want to make sure that we mentor and train that young cook as he goes through the different stations in our restaurant and one day can become the next sous chef or the next chef de cuisine. He may leave as well in the meantime, but we have also contributed to the success of our industry which is very important for me. Creating opportunities for young chefs. And this is all around us. This is all around me. I realized when I wrote the French Laundry Cookbook, it was my book, something that was really close to me. So it come close to me emotionally uh, as, as well as professionally. It was a success. The author, or I'm sorry, the, the, the editor and publisher said, Thomas, write another book. I said, I don't have anything else to say. I'm done. I mean, this is, this is it. And I still don't, really. Um, it's, an interesting, it's, an, it's, it's, it's an interesting road, and, and one that I started to think about differently a couple years after the French Laundry Cook 
cookbook came out. Was I being selfish by not writing another book? Was I being irresponsible to the opportunity that was in front of us? I changed my mind. I said, yes, I'm being selfish and irresponsible. Because I have a restaurant down the street with a wonderful chef named Jeffrey Circiello, who I can then pass on that opportunity to. And I did exactly that. Bouchon Cookbook, even though it has my name on it, is Jeffrey's book and the team at Bouchon. Under Pressure is another book that has my name on it. Jonathan Benno, per se, three years ago came to me and said, he does this all the time, Chef, we have to be the first American restaurant to write a book on sous vide. Now, we have all these opportunities. We have this knowledge. I said, sure, let's do that. There it is, under pressure. And the same thing has happened for Ad Hoc, our new cookbook coming out. It's about ha looking at the opportunities today, realizing the advantages of embracing those opportunities, not for yourself, but for members of the team. The opportunities that are there need to be extended for growth for the other staff, for the other staff, for the other team members. The other thing that we're faced with besides mentorship, training, and opportunities is stewardship. Now, I was just uh, honored in Monterey Bay at the Monterey Bay Aquarium last weekend for uh, leading the way in sustainable agriculture as a chef. And I'm thinking, God, did I really do that? I don't remember doing any of that stuff. And sometimes you don't do that for a specific reason other than it's the right thing to do. We started a garden at the French Laundry over 10 years ago. We've been culti cultivating and farming that. We've been working with some of our suppliers who have the same philosophy about sustainability. We search out not the sustainable producers, but the quality product, wherever it comes from. My job as a chef is to do just that, find the best available products, bring them to our restaurant so that our guests can enjoy them. Cooking is about two things. It's an equation, very simple. Regardless of what level you're cooking at, whether it's here at Google, whether it's a fine dining at the French Laundry, whether it's a family style restaurant at Ad Hoc, it's all about product and execution. If I can get a better product than my, the chef next to me, I'm gonna be a better chef. If I can get a better staff and a better product, I'm gonna be an extraordinary chef. And that's exactly what we spend a lot of time on, is resourcing. Working with people to create relationships that are gonna be fruitful for us in years to come. People say, Thomas, I want my food to taste like your food, and, 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 and I, have to, I have to chuckle a little bit because it's not, your food is not really gonna taste like my food, even if you follow the same recipe, because you don't have the opportunity to get the same food that I do today. Doesn't mean that tomorrow you don't have that opportunity. In 32 years, what I've seen become available in our grocery stores, in our markets, is extraordinary. When I was a young boy, we had iceberg lettuce and green tomatoes. There wasn't, there wasn't the, the plethora of, of fresh produce that we see today. There weren't the green markets that we see today. And it really was, it's really, it's really a, I don't wanna say a miracle, but it's amazing what happens in America. If you think about this farm to plate trend, if you will, if that is a trend, it's become something that's very important to us, right? We have green, what are they called? Green boxes here outside? Earth boxes. How many of you have gardens at home? How many of you grew up with gardens at home? A lot of you. How come you don't have gardens at home then if you grew up with them? <laughs> I don't understand. Before World War II, our society was farm to table throughout our country. That was the only availability we had. There weren't the type of grocery stores we have today. There wasn't the type of transportation we have today. It was all farm to table. World War II came along, men went to the war, women went to work, World War II ended, men came home, women stayed at work. So what happened? They had to feed, the same th another thing happened was the baby boom. All of a sudden, we have mother and father working and a lot of children running around at home. How do we feed them? Convenience foods. We're not that far away from a time in our, in, in our, in our history, in our country, when everything was farm to table. And, and it's really encouraging for me to see that coming back now in a, in, a, in a real way. The movement for sustainability, the movement for farm to table is really extraordinary. But I remember back in 1977 when a chef named Jean-Louis Paladin moved to Washington, D.C. from France. 
He looked around and said, I don't understand. There is no good food in this country. <laughs> he was used to that in France. He went out, southern Maryland, northern Virginia, started to create relationships with farmers, and started immediately having an impact on the way chefs think about food. We have our own angel here in Northern California. Her name is Alice Waters. She was doing the same thing at the same time, setting the example for chefs. Chefs embraced that, started to do that. And what's happened now? What's available to consumers is directly related to what Jean-Louis Paladin and Alice Waters do. What chefs have done since then, you are starting to see that now. What you need to do, what we need to realize in this country, if we're really going to have an impact on our food sources, is that we need to be able to make a difference with our pocketbook. We're a culture that wants to have the very best for the very least. We, we have to, we have to, we have to dis disregard that. If we're really going to support our farmers, really going to support the people who are raising our cattle, really support our fishermen, we need to be able to support them with real dollars. They cannot do what they need to do if we're, going to need to, if we're going to negotiate with them on every level. I don't ask my suppliers, my purveyors, how much something costs. It's not my job. It's not that I don't care how much something costs, but it's not my job. It's not my primary concern how much something costs. My primary concern is the quality of the product that they're selling me. Because that's what's going to make me a better chef, is the quality of that product. Diane St. Clair is a woman that sells us butter. About eight years ago, I received in the mail, FedEx, a Ziploc bag with three little pieces of butter in it, <laughs> and a note. Hello, Chef Keller. My, my name is Diane St. Clair. I have a small dairy farm in Vermont. It's in Orwell, Vermont. Can anybody guess what the name is? Orwell, George, Animal Farm, right. <laughs> Small farm being four cows. I read your book, and I realized that your purveyors were really important to you. Can you please taste my butter and let me know what you think? I tasted the butter, and it was the most extraordinary butter I'd ever tasted. I called Diane on the phone. I said, Diane. This is amazing. Um, I'd like to buy your butter. How much do you make? I make 15 pounds a week. <laughs> okay. We'll buy 15 pounds a week. Whatever you have, whatever you make, we'll buy. Just, just send it out. Just send it out. I, I, I don't know how much it cost to buy that butter. But it was so amazing that how could I pass it up? I couldn't. I couldn't pass it up. Here's a woman who gets up seven days a week right? Milks the cows twice a day. Every day. The cows don't take a day off. <laughs> to make 15 pounds of butter. How much do you think it's worth? I mean, at, at, at twice market, it's $6 a pound? What is she making a week? You do the math. $90? To get up seven days a week and milk the cows twice a day, she's making $90? I mean, it, 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 just, it was extraordinary, the dedication and commitment this woman had to producing this butter. So today, we support Diane. She called me several years ago, and she said, Thomas, I have to raise the price of the butter. I'm sorry, I'm getting divorced, and I'm not going to be able to support myself. What am I going to say to her? No, sorry, we've got to negotiate on the price here. What am I going to say to Diane St. Clair after eight years of doing business with her when she has to now support a young child, support her farm? You do the right thing, whatever. Her butter cost me $16 a pound today. Is it worth it? It's worth every penny because you know what? Diane St. Clair has security. She knows every week she has a check coming from me. She knows she gets up every morning and milks the cows twice a day, seven days a week. She knows that she's sending her butter to Per Se in the French Laundry. She knows we appreciate that, and she knows that the guests appreciate that. She gets letters all the time. She takes six weeks off a year when the calves are calving. That's it. Every other day. She works. Even at $16 a pound, she's got three more cows. She makes 50 pounds of butter a week. You do the math. How much does she make a year? So 
My responsibility is to making sure that people like Diane St. Clair can continue to do the work that they love. There, there, there are dozens of examples of Diane St. Clair's out there. How do you make an impact? You make an impact like that. Creating relationships with people that you buy food from. I don't care if it's at the farmer's market or at Safeway. If there's something that's not good that you don't want, something, or something, that's, that you, something that you want to criticize, you feel is, 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 doesn't have the quality or the standards that you're looking for, or something that they don't have that you're looking for, be a voice. Be a voice. It's really important. Most of us won't be a voice. Most of us won't complain. Most of us won't say what we want. We just won't go back. How many of you have been to a restaurant and had a bad experience and, and, and just say, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going back to that restaurant? Huh? How many of you have really gone to the restaurant and say, you know what, you know, I'm going to give you some feedback <laughs> so that now you can grow and you can learn? It's important. No. Tell JC here what you don't like in the cafeterias. <laughs> it's nice to always hear compliments. Oh, chef, it was a great meal. I love this. I love that. I'm very appreciative of that. But I want to know what you didn't like. Because it's what you didn't like that I can now change and have an impact on. So I got a little bit off track there. But stewardship is very important for us, making sure that we are supporting our farmers. We are supporting. Um, our suppliers, our fishermen. Uh, we're making sure that we're making the right choices. We recently uh, in, installed a geothermal loop system at our restaurant, the French Laundry. I got a letter from the um, uh, California Conservation Board congratulating me for doing that, the first restaurant in Northern California. I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I didn't do it for any conservation reasons. I did it because I needed to air, you know, air condition three new buildings on our property. And by doing that conventionally, it would have had an impact, uh, 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 a severe impact on the environment to our guests. I was thinking about our guest experience, not the, not the conservation. I do things because it's the right thing to do for specific reasons. And sometimes the byproduct of that results in a more sustainable restaurant. We want to make sure that there is a future in our industry. We want to have impacts in, in many different ways. We want to set the examples as chefs. We want to set the examples as businessmen. We want to set the examples for the next generation. We want to, we want to support our, our, our guests. We want to support the consumers. We want to support our farmers in ways that are meaningful so that we can continue to have the opportunity to eat great food. And looking around the cafeterias today, it's amazing the quality of the products that are available to you. So congratulations and thank you very much. So there's a, there's a little bit of time for some questions. I know most of you have to go back to work um, at 3 o'clock. I have to go back to work, too. And I'll be there until 1 o'clock this morning. So <laughs> this is my side job. I had some questions here as well, but um, yeah, take, one take, take one of those. Um, please describe a dish that is simple enough for an amateur to prepare. <laughs> Remember the difference between a professional and an amateur, right? An amateur doesn't get paid to do what he does. Doesn't mean that he's not as, as equipped to do it. Um, but with that said, um, Cooking is, you know, if you do something right the first time, if you get it right the first time, you're probably lucky. You know, if you, if you look at a recipe and you, and, and, and you follow the recipe and it comes out the way it should, it's, it's, it's for luck. It's about that repetition, doing it over and over and over again. One thing that I love to make it, for, for a number of different reasons on different levels is, is, is gnocchi, potato gnocchi. Uh, it transforms a potato into something that has, becomes a vehicle for so many Different, different ways of serving it, so many different sauces. Something that is also can be, can be frozen and used later on, so it's convenience food. Something that children love to be involved in as well. Um, so potato gnocchi is something that I, that I find great satisfaction and gratification in making. And something that gets better every time you make it, because you start to understand the nuances 
of the potato because the potato being an agricultural product certainly changes, right? From the time it's harvested to the time possibly you use it. I mean, the potato can be two months old, stored. So what happens to the starches or the sugars turns to starches? Understanding how that, that mixture feels at different times is, is something that for me is a challenge and something for me I love to do. Touching food is a pleasure. Hi, thanks for coming to Google. Thank um, you. What is your favorite dish that you've ever served at French Laundry or per se, yours personally? That's a, that's a, that's a really difficult question uh, and, and one that's impossible for me to answer because we change our menu every day. It's a constant evolution uh, in our menu. I think the, the, the one thing that I have great, great, great satisfaction in making every day is, is the coronet. I don't know if, if any of you have seen the coronet. Um, and I have great, you know, it, it, it has great meaning for me because it represents a time in my life which was, which was extraordinarily sad, um, but extremely enlightening at the same time. It was a time in my life when I was leaving New York City, which I used to think was the center of the universe, but now since I moved to California, I realize it's not. Um, uh, and it represented a, a moment when I realized what inspiration was. Um, and, and how inspiration can be significant in your life. Um, I was leaving New York. It was one of the last weekends I was in New York and I was with some very close friends. One of the things, one of the rituals that we would do once a month, we would go to Chinatown and eat in one of the dim sum restaurants and then go across the street to this Baskin Robbins to get ice cream cone because none of us like green tea, ice cream. And, um, and we did exactly that. And I don't know how many times as a young child growing up in America, I had seen an ice cream cone. How many times I've gone to that Baskin Robbins in the 10 years I lived in New York City and seen an ice cream cone in that store. Um, the challenge that was faced, I was faced with at the time, which was, which was moving to California, moving to Los Angeles, the owner of the restaurant that I was taking over said, Thomas, you're coming to Los Angeles. There's a international, uh, 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 some kind of food conference going on and I want you to come here and wow the Angelinos with something. And I'm thinking, I've got all this pressure of moving across the country just lost my restaurant, leaving the place that I never thought I would leave before. And this, this guy wants me to wow the Angelinos in the first weekend I'm there. All this is going on in my head. And I, we walk across the street and order an ice cream cone. And the young lady puts the ice cream cone in the little holder. And at that moment, I saw the cornet. Why? I have no idea. I don't know what inspires me. But I do know that unless you're aware of the world around you, you're not going to be inspired. Open your eyes. Be aware. Because inspiration can come from anywhere. And of course, what happens after inspiration? I was inspired by the ice cream cone to do the coronet. I could be inspired by something totally different to do something else. I'm going to interpret it, that inspiration, as something that's meaningful for me. We can be inspired by the same thing, and you can interpret it in something that's different, something that's meaningful for you. And then of course, after, after interpretation comes evolution. I can tell you the first time I made those coronets, how difficult it was. And then it evolved, and we developed a recipe. We developed techniques for that. So awareness leads to inspiration, leads to interpretation, leads to evolution. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, one of your passions was fine dining, and you really wanted to stay true to that. Um, now you've opened uh, several other restaurants that are, I'd say, a little bit more accessible. Uh, I guess two questions. One, are you going to ever open your infamous burger restaurant that was going to be in the ad hoc building? And, and two, do the economics work to open a fine dining restaurant today that is not either, like when you went open per se, you were heavily subsidized by the Time Warner Center, or restaurants are often subsidized by hotels, so guests will stay there. Does it re and the other situation is you have some that are flagship restaurants that are kind of supported mm -hmm. by the, uh, the more accessible uh, brother and sister restaurants. Mm -hmm. Can you really do a standalone like you did when you opened the French Laundry? Or is that just not economically possible these days? No, I think you can. I think you know if you look at Daniel Patterson at, at Qua in San Francisco, uh, it's 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 a it's a real example of someone who opened a restaurant in the same way I opened the French Laundry. Uh, you look at at, at Quince, what uh, Michael and Lindsay Tusk did at Quince, uh, reminded me a lot of what we did at the French Laundry. Um, you know, how they'll evolve remains to be seen, but certainly they're, they're, they have a very, um, uh, a very strong vision about where they want to be culinarily, where they want to be from a service point of view, where they want to be considered in the hierarchy of restaurants. And I would consider both those restaurants uh, to be fine dining. It's true that, you know, many fine dining restaurants today are, are so um, 
so costly that they do need to be subsidized um, by, by, by something else, as i.e. the Time Warner Center uh, or a, a hotel. Uh, it certainly makes it easy for, for a chef uh, to get in that. But you notice that none of those chefs that are being subsidized are young chefs who are setting out on their own. They're, they're typically chefs like myself, Alan Ducas. I mean, they're, they're, known, they're known entities, and it's typically their second restaurant. Um, so I think certainly it's still, there's still opportunities out there everywhere, and even more so today in this economic climate, to, to find a restaurant and, 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 and to start, then start it organically uh, in, in, in the same way that the, the French Laundry started. Um, the Burgers and Half Bottles restaurant that you, that you mentioned is something that you know, certainly has been um, on, on, my, on top of my priority list for about 15 years now. <laughs> I think I'm a little behind the curve now since so many of my other colleagues have opened hamburger restaurants. And um, I was really disappointed that Ad Hoc was such a success because I really wanted to do it there. Nonetheless, I think Ad Hoc is, is, is a wonderful restaurant. Uh, and in many ways reminds me of the French Laundry when I bought the French Laundry. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so a lot of people love your food for obvious reasons, but I wanted to know if you have a favorite dish you like eating, you know, on a weekend or on a regular day. And a roast and chicken. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, a perfect roast chicken is, is probably for me, uh, signifies so many, so many things, uh, you know, certainly, um, uh, extreme comfort because I've had you know wonderful memories with roast chicken before. Um, it, it it it's very satisfying. Uh, it's a textural and aroma arom, aroma of that of that chicken and the way it tastes, the flavor um, is so compelling to me and so simple. And I think the simplicity of it, it it makes it that much more inviting for me. And I love one pot food. I love to put something in one one pot and, and get it all cooked. So vegetables and that chicken and throw it in the oven. You're dialed in. Yes? Um, one of the oh, computer ones. OK, well, let, me, let me take one more from. Um, how do you maintain consistency across your restaurants, particularly now that you have locations in New York, Las Vegas, and Yonville, and soon to be LA? Um, it's, really, it's really about teamwork. Uh, I don't, you know, the chefs are, are, are by nature very controlling people. And I certainly was one of the most controlling people, um, I didn't seem to think so, but everybody said that about me, um, <laughs> to, come, to come across the, uh, uh, the, the landscape of, of the culinary world in America. Um, nonetheless, I think you have, you know, if you're going to uh, really embrace other opportunities, whether it's opening other restaurants, writing a book, or whatever the opportunities that are coming and confronting you, if you're going to embrace other opportunities, you have to give up control. And to give up control means you have to have trust and confidence in the people that you're giving up the control to. So the restaurants that, that I own today, uh, first of all, let me say, I, I'm no longer a chef, OK? I mean, a chef, to me, is defined by somebody that's in their kitchen every day working with their team. Obviously, that's not me. I'm standing in front of you. I should be, if I was a, if I was a true meaning of a chef, I'd be home today working in the kitchen. Um, I talked about the modern chef, and that, that defines me a little more, which means that I have chef de cuisines, or, or chefs of our restaurants. Treat it like it's yours, and one day it will be. Exactly my philosophy. You give up that control. You have trust. You have confidence in, an, in other chefs. Corey Lee at the French Laundry, Jonathan Benno at Per Se, Mark Hopper in Las Vegas, Philip Tessier at Bouchon and Yonville, David Cruz, are, are the chefs of those individual restaurants. And it's their restaurant. And that's how they treat it. So it, it enables me to have somewhat of, of, of a bit of freedom to be able to really look at other opportunities in ways that are going to be meaningful for that generation of chefs or for the next generation of chefs. Um, I had one of the most amazing dishes uh, in my, I was a chef before, in my early chefhood uh, at Raquel. Uh, Raquel. At, at Raquel, it was the braised uh, lamb breast that was breaded. And it was just amazing, this combination of flavors. And I was eating it in a three quarters empty dining room with my friends. And I was thinking, why isn't there anybody else here? And I was wondering, you've gone around the edges a little bit, but could you talk a bit about the, um, what you need to be confident to be when you have doubts about what you're doing and your collaborators, mm -hmm. clearly the people that you rely on for support. 
your, your collaborator at Raquel, the, the customers aren't supporting your vision. How do you keep going? Because this is one of the things I found most admirable and amazing about you, and you've remained <laughs> seemingly so humble <laughs> at the same time. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about going there. Right. Well, you know, certainly it's about persistence, you know, continuing to, 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 to stay true to what, what my desires were and what my, what my goals were. Raquel was my restaurant in New York City. It was called Raquel, R-A-K-E-L. Uh, my partner's name was Raul. My name was Keller, obviously, and that's why we called it Raquel. Uh, it was on the cutting edge. Uh, it, was, it was actually a cutting edge neighborhood, which was called Hudson Square, which was no, no, really wasn't Tribeca, nor was it, was it uh, uh, the village. It was kind of West Villagey, really West, West, West Village. Um, and at the time we opened, it was, um, it was significant because the advertising agencies from Park Avenue South were all moving down there. We had Saatchi and Saatchi, uh, Jerry Della Femina, which were two of the biggest ad agencies in, in the world at the time, two of the most creative ag agencies in the world at the time. Uh, they were all moving down there. And, and I think we were, we were poised to, to really have great success. At least we had great success, I should say success being financial success, uh, for, for, for the first three years. Of course, we had critical success as well. Um, for the first three years. Uh, and then, of course, the bottom fell on the stock market, and the advertising agency stopped, stopped coming down. They stopped getting as much accounts as they did. And we were kind of in this quasi-new neighborhood, um, this fine dining restaurant uh, that um, wasn't, wasn't as attractive anymore to, to the core group of, of, um, of restaurant goers in New York City. It was too far south for the, the conservatives on the Upper East Side to travel to. There was no more of the younger, um, you know, the, the younger crowd that was on Wall Street or in the advertising agencies that were on that, that, that hip cutting edge area. Uh, and, and it was the demise of Raquel. That was just one reason. Uh, what I really learned in, at Raquel, uh, not only about, you know, economics having an impact, uh, um, national economics have an impact on restaurants, but also what I gained out of that, that failure was that I was a really good cook. I was a terrible accountant, and I didn't know how to run a dining room at all. Um, and it really requires those three, it's a tripod, to run a, to run a restaurant. So when I, when I opened the French Laundry, I made sure that I had those two other people. I had a really good bookkeeper who could tell me where we were financially. And I had somebody in the dining room who knew how to run a dining room. And I was going to be in the kitchen. And that was what I think was the foundation for the success of Raquel. Shannon, one more question? Thank you. Uh, hi, so uh, I guess possibly a corollary to the wider availability of a variety of ingredients these days is uh, what seems to be an ever-increasing prevalence of restaurant goers who have dietary constraints, mm -hmm. uh, either uh, social or, or medical, you know, vegetarian, veganism, gluten-free diets and whatnot. Sure. Uh, would you agree that that's uh, sort of increasingly prevalent? And if so, how does that impact how you do menu selection in fine dining scenarios? And, and what would you say to uh, people who do have those constraints uh, and might find mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming to a place like the French Laundry, therefore, uh, dubious undertaking? Right. It, 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 is, it is more prevalent today than it was. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't know anybody who was allergic to anything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I didn't know anybody who poked their eye out with a pencil. I didn't know anybody who, who got sick drinking out of a, uh, out of a, uh, out of a hose or any of those things. Um, today, you can't do anything as a child, um, and and maybe that's part of our problem. I'm not really sure, but without saying anything about our, uh, about that, um, it it is it is something that's prevalent today, and and we're we're totally comfortable with it. I mean, if you're if you're allergic to something medically or allergic to something. Um, just because you don't like it, and certain that, that's that's the other thing that really, there you know we get people come in and say they're allergic to something. They're not really allergic to it. They just don't like it. So if you're if you're that person, just say you don't like it. It's okay. We understand. You can't like everything, um, because allergies are something that are really really important to us and something that we, we take very seriously. And if you're allergic to garlic, for example, we really need to know that uh, if it's a true allergy, because you know we start our socks with garlic, but that's you know five generations you know beforehand before we get to our final product and may not have an impact on your allergy. Who knows? Um, regardless, uh, it's you know well, we think about our restaurants. When you think about great restaurants, and there was an article written um, in the New York Magazine in 1986 about how to eat healthy in great restaurants. And to me, that was such such a bizarre article because if it's a great restaurant, you're going to eat healthy because the the sense of refinement, the sense of um, of dedication to the quality of the product, 
is, is, is paramount to, to a fine dining restaurant. So you should eat healthy. The other thing is if you're allergic to something or don't like something, a fine dining restaurant, a restaurant at the top of the pyramid, should be able to adjust, should be flexible to whatever your needs are. Uh, so that's always been, been my philosophy. Whatever you want, I'm going to try to give you. If you want to come, if you say, Chef, I really feel like cornflakes tonight, and I can give you a bowl of cornflakes, you go out to the restaurant and say, you know, I asked for Keller for cornflakes and he gave it to me. I'm really happy. <laughs> that's what I want. I want, you, I want you to be satisfied when you, when you leave our restaurant. Um, and whatever that takes, I want to do. And of course, that's within, within reason. Um, uh, you know, vegans are not, are, not a, are not a problem at all. I mean, to cook vegetables, it's got to be one of the easiest things in the world to do. Um, vegetarians, the same way. Pescatarians, uh, you know, poultrytarians, I mean, whatever. <laughs> whatever you want, we'll, we'll try to do for you. At whatever level our restaurants are, and I'm just talking about, you know, French Andier per se, I'm talking about Bouchon or Ad Hoc. We all try to embrace the same philosophy about our guests, is we're there to make the experience better for you. And however we can do that, we want to be able to, okay? Thank you all very much. I appreciate you coming your time. <laughs>